<laughs> uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Hillel Fratkin. I'm a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute and director of its Center on Islam, Democracy, and the Future of the Muslim World, and co-editor of its journal, Current Trends in Islamist Ideology. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to our conference, uh, those here and also watching on you streaming, is that correct? Okay. Um, <clears throat> entitled, When Iran Gets the Bomb, What Will It Do? What Will Others Do? What Will Be the Pause? Um, I'd also like to thank the Singer Foundation for supporting this project. Uh, we'll have two sessions this morning, um, and I will introduce our participants in a moment. Um, but first, I should say that for today, they are not who I will say they are, nor is today, today, uh, June 21st, 2012. Rather, it is a day some years hence when, uh, on, the assumption, on the premise of this conference, Iran may have a small nuclear arsenal. Let me stress may. We are not prejudging that such will be the case. Uh, we're only asking the question, uh, what uh, might happen if that is the case? We are here to imagine what might happen uh, what if, in, uh, in a few years' time, Iran has a nuclear arsenal, and in our second panel, what will happen if uh, they are joined in their region by other nuclear powers? For this purpose, we have asked our distinguished panelists to imagine themselves to be senior personnel of the different countries in the region and outside of it, personnel of, uh, of Iran uh, and other countries with which Iran may interact. But now let me introduce them as they were before this morning and will be again afterwards. Uh, first, um, and I will introduce them all in order so that we can, uh, all together so we can uh, not interrupt the flow of conversation. Uh, first, uh, Ambassador Hussein Haqqani. Uh, Hussein is a professor of international relations at Boston University. <clears throat> Until recently, he was the Pakistani ambassador to the United States. Uh, he was also formerly Pakistani ambassador to Sri Lanka. I also, on a personal note, uh, have to mention that he is um, co-founder of uh, our journal, Current Trends in Islamist Ideology. Our second uh, panelist is David Wormser. David is founder of Delphi Global Analysis, and uh, prior to that had a distinguished career of service in the U.S. government. He was an advisor to Vice President Richard Cheney, uh, a special assistant at the State Department to John Bolton, and to round out his government service, uh, he was um, an officer in the U.S. Navy uh, with the rank of Lieutenant Commander. Uh, our third speaker is Samantha Ravitch. <clears throat> she was formerly Deputy National Security Advisor to Vice President Cheney, um, is currently co-chair of the National Commission for the review of research and development programs in the intelligence community, uh, and senior advisor for the Chertoff Group. Our last speaker, uh, our last panelist for this, uh, this first panel is Ali Alphone. Uh, Ali is a resident fellow at, at the American Enterprise Institute. Um, <clears throat> he was a fellow at the Institute for Strategy at the Royal Danish Defense College, a uh, research assistant for the Danish Parliament, a researcher, I think you said independent researcher, at the Institute for Political and International Studies in Tehran, um, and is a uh, graduate of the University of Copenhagen. Um, I will now... Uh, turn uh, things over to my colleague, uh, uh, Scooter Libby. Hello, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Hillel. Uh, I'm just going to make one brief word about the spirit of this, which Hillel alluded to. After every major foreign policy disaster, um, we always hear, well, what didn't they 
what didn't they see? What didn't they listen to? What didn't they imagine? They being the policymakers of the day, whose activities led into a problem. So, um, this is your chance today to get those thoughts out. Um, it's great statesmen have to form <coughs> an intuition about the future. This, we're not looking today for proof. There is no proof of the future. It cannot be done. Um, we're not even looking for prediction. I want to emphasize that. We're not looking to ask the panelists or the audience or others to predict what will happen precisely, but more to think about what might happen. And so it's in that spirit that we're um, asking the members today to think about um, where the region might turn under the assumption, um, which will last all morning, that uh, um, Iran has nuclear weapons. And in this panel, under the assumption that only Iran has nuclear weapons, uh, among the uh, Islamic or Arabic states. So. Um, we'll <clears throat> ask, um, I was about to uh, contradict myself by asking Ambassador Haqqani to, uh, uh, to start things off, but I will perhaps just refer to him as uh, Sheikh Haqqani, <laughs> um, um, and ask him, uh, as we've asked all the panelists, to, to begin with uh, their first reflections on uh, what um, being uh, uh, holding responsible positions in the Iranian uh, regime uh, now in possession of nuclear weapons um, what uh, they would like to do not with the weapons but with uh, the pursuit of their goal well, let me just begin by saying that uh, if we go into the history of nuclear weapons, except for the first, uh, for the Second World War, nuclear weapons have never actually been used. And the reason for that is that uh, these weapons of mass destruction have been construed by those who have them as a means of enforcing or ensuring the status quo, not of changing it. Because if you think about it, that's what the idea was when the United States, after the Second World War, retained nuclear weapons the first ideas were always to deter Soviet aggression in Europe, particularly where the Soviet Union had a preponderance of uh, conventional uh, capability. Uh, and so therefore, uh, the nuclear weapon was the way of ensuring that the Soviet Union does not cross the line. When the Soviet Union got the nuclear weapons, then it was about mutually assured destruction again to ensure that the status quo remains. Um, uh, then the other three members came in, uh, Britain, France, and China, in varying degrees, and none of them wanted to use or uh, construe nuclear weapons as a uh, instrument of changing the status quo. So I think that is something that needs to be understood at the very outset. In case of Iran, are nuclear weapons meant to uh, to keep the status quo? If it is to keep the status quo, what status quo would Iran want? So I think that the reason why Iran's nuclear weapons are particularly different and problematic for the rest of the world and the region is because Iran wants nuclear weapons not to maintain a status quo, uh, but rather to try and alter it or change it in Iran's favor. And I think that is uh, uh, th that will then prompt the reaction of others in the region. Iran does not have a problem with Pakistan, which is itself a nuclear uh, uh, nation. Uh, so Iran's uh, desire to change the status quo can only be towards the west and north of Iran, uh, not uh, to the east. Both India and Pakistan have nuclear weapons, and at some point the world will have to come to terms with those nuclear weapons of India and Pakistan. I've been saying this for a while in this town, most people don't like hearing it, but you can't have the non-proliferation treaty of the 1960s valid at a time when two other nations are actually declared nuclear weapons uh, nations without people re uh, re wanting to recognize it. So the first reaction that I expect from an Iranian nuclear weapons program materializing and Iran having a bomb is that there will be a number of Arab countries that would start looking for nuclear weapons, uh, primarily uh, to try and deter any potential for Iranian attempts to change the status quo. Um, but how would, if I may interrupt at this point, but how would you, as Iran, want to change the status quo? I'm, I'm coming to that. Now, if I'm Iran and I'm, 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 I'm thinking about this, here's how I would see it. I would see that any, any nuclear engagement with Israel uh, would have consequences because your geography, you can't hit Israel without hitting or causing 
call out for the Palestinians and others in the region, uh, Lebanon, etc. Uh, <coughs> therefore, uh, even though the rhetoric is all anti-Israel, uh, Iran will have to think many, many times. Secondly, it could, uh, it could result in retaliation from the United States. So the way <coughs> I would change the status quo is by leveraging my nuclear weapons or Iran's nuclear weapons uh, in combination with other asymmetric instruments of power. And that has already happened in South Asia. For example, one of the reasons why the Pakistani-India uh, conflagration has not been resolved is because, uh, because of the presence of nuclear weapons, Pakistan feels confident uh, that there will be no conventional war right now without it being escalated into nuclear weapons. And that's what, what, the, what was the doctrine behind Cargill. I don't know how many people in this room remember Cargill or how many people around this table when Pakistan actually tried to change the status quo in Kashmir on the assumption that you can use. And that is exactly what Iran would like to do. It would you'd want a nuclear umbrella for its efforts to asymmetrically change power within the Middle East. Um, the targets would be the Gulf nations. Uh, it already has instruments like uh, Hezbollah, uh, other such instruments would also arrive. And that would be the objective of having nuclear weapons from the point of view of Iran. Um, Iran would also then try and see who are those that are capable of having nuclear weapons on the Arab side and will try and do its best to block them from developing that capability. And those being primarily Egypt, Saudi Arabia, who have the size, the capability, um, Iraq, um, uh, whether it can rebuild its nuclear program all the uh, uh, Again, um, the smaller players, not possibly so much, but definitely will the smaller players allow Americans, for example, uh, to base nuclear uh, weapons uh, in Bahrain, Qatar, Kuwait. And those would be the considerations that the Iranians would be having if they get the bomb. Uh, I, I will <coughs> also address you as Sheikh. <laughs> slight, slight thing. In case of Iran, you should call us either Hujjatul Islam or Ayatullah. The well, sheikhs, the sheikhs are usually on the Sunni side. I, I realize that, uh, but I hadn't yet determined. I hadn't yet determined exactly which rank in the uh, up cleric you decided you were going to be. But now I, well, I still don't know. Is it <laughs> Ayatollah or Hujjatul Islam? Um. Well, I think to look at the question of what sort of an impact the bomb would have on the uh, behavior of Iran and what it, what specifically it might entail, I think you have to first take a step back and understand the key fissure within the Iranian regime and who would be vindicated or validated by the achieving of a successful nuclear program. Now, I, I certainly subscribe to the idea that there were sort of two broad camps that uh, have been writing on this since 2006 between sort of the traditional clerical establishment, the quote rationalist school. By rationalist, I do not mean they would be rational in using a bomb by these interminable debates, which are way off the mark here. I mean, I'm referring to a 400-year-old tradition within Shiism. Um, any rate, there's the sort of clerical establishment that is highly revolutionary and very <coughs> dangerous. And the second is an anti-clerical school. Um, it emanates ultimately from Ali Shariat, the uh, Ayatollah back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, I, I go to this because ultimately they diverge not on uh, many hardline versus moderate issues. That's, that's not at all the issue. The issue is, I think, um, uh, one anchors its very existence in, in the existence of the Iranian regime to the idea of the Valiat the Faqih. It's the focal point of all legitimacy of the Iranian system. The latter tends to be more subterranean, conspiratorial. It's infiltrated, eventually gained control of the IRGC. Um, but the key here is what are the theological implications of each? Um, I think the ideological essence of the Valiat al camp, the clerical camp, the Valiat al is the rule of the jurisprudent, which is essentially the Iranian system as we all know it. Uh, Khomeini, the leader, has sort of semi-divine characteristics. Um, 
basically, they believe that the 12th Imam, which went into hiding or occultation, is not coming back very soon. And there is now a mundane structure in place which can act in the Imam's name with the authority, with some degree of the spirit of the Imam, uh, until he returns, which is not expected to be anytime soon. This mundane structure, then, is the essence of the revolution and its careful protection and cultivated per uh, preservation is the priority, as is the need to ensure its proper custodians, namely the leading families of Kuwait, <coughs> remain in control of it. And being a revolutionary, and I emphasize revolutionary, offshoot of a traditional Shiite mode of thinking, this crowd reverts to a time-tested strategy of survival and, and um, progress when threatened, maneuver and deception. Um, so it acts, in, it acts consistent with the thousand years of Shiite tradition, a besieged community in a Sunni world operating with great maneuver and tactical cleverness. It is the Iran of Sherazad, Thousand and One Nights, uh, and its life is the, dominated by the quest for survival and a need to keep one's head down while you're maneuvered to advance. The second crowd, the anti-clericist crowd, believes the imam is imminently about to return and that, that it would be a big mistake to prioritize the mundane survival of this regime or, or of the Valiat al-Faqi and guarantee the continued custodianship of it by traditional masters. Uh, more important is the need to execute the will of Allah and prepare for the imminent return of the imam, any less as a failure of genuine faith. And as such, the traditional Shiite strategy of maneuver and deception is itself an admission of weakness, unconfidence, and perhaps even a lack of faith. And a frontal challenge to the West should be met, will be met with divine support because it advances the return of the Imam and the new world which will follow. So you have two very different views. I think it played out to some extent on this big debate over the nuclear fatwa that we heard over the last month or two, the ostensible fatwa uh, by, by Khomeini, uh, Khamenei where he said you can't produce, stockpile, develop, I forgot exact wording, but essentially they can't go for a bomb. Uh, I'm not going to get into whether the fatwa exists or not, but the bottom line is there's plenty of other fatwas and so forth that indicate that, that they indeed do intend going for a bomb. But the whole episode really reflected something else, which was the need to put out the information about this fatwa was indicative of Khamenei's and that crowd's desire to engage in deception against the West because they're not confident that a direct confront, co confronting uh, posture will get them where they need to get. In contrast, you have others like Ayatollah Mesbech Yazdi and some in the IRGC crowd which are more brazenly out there saying, no, we're, we're going for a bomb. Uh, and I think, again, it reflects that deep seated <coughs> difference, which is, look, Allah will come and, and help us when we need to, uh, when we need it, when we need the intervention. You saw that in the 2007 National Intelligence Estimate. You saw just before it, Khamenei and others beginning to warn Ahmadinejad, you know, we have to be careful. The West can be very dangerous here. So we have to, you know, one step forward, two steps back, three steps forward, that sort of thing. Ahmadinejad just didn't believe it. Uh, the, the crowd around him didn't believe it. And then came the NIE, and it was very interesting to see how this played out within the Iranian regime. Ahmadinejad instantly seized it and said, look, Allah intervened to, and literally he used these words, sow confusion within the corridors of Western power to grant Iran a victory. Um, I think this is a microcosm of what will happen if you see Iran get the bomb. It will be, it will be a validation of that school of thought that ultimately it was the divine will. Now, just two quick quotes to show exactly how serious this is. This is from Ayatollah Mesbech Yazdi, on, more on the side of Ahmadinejad in the crowd. Is In seeking to acquire the technology for, for a nuclear bomb, essentially, Iran must be patient and not be deterred by economic shortages. Divine messianic support 
has been the determining factor of the Iranian regime during the various trying periods which have plagued it since its foundation. Now, if you think that doesn't, that's just Mesbach Yazdi and, Ayat, and um, Ahmadinejad, and it's not the crowd, you know, they, they seem to be a little bit on the out, so maybe the new crowd or the crowd that's now more in, Larijani or Khamenei, or the national security advisor who's the chief negotiator is a little different. Um, the chief negotiator is Saeed Jalili, and he's even more uh, determined. He said outright, uh, avoiding past experience of sacrificing principles when faced with a challenge, principles should not be sacrificed in the name of pragmatism. Uh, it demonstrates cartoon-like behavior, which causes 180-degree <laughs> turns in foreign policy without any basis. Policy should be coupled with reliance on divine assistance and should be based on a theological model which will bring a good ending in this and the next world, as was the intention of the Islamic Revolution. Uh, so he also went on to suggest that pragmatism should be seen as willful disobedience of the divine will. Now, so Iran gets a bomb. What does this mean? This is the crowd that takes over. This is the crowd that will, seek, that, that will be validated by that event. And their view is that you don't need tactical maneuver or deception. You directly confront. You confront like you did in the 80s. And this is the narrative of their camp, which was in the 1980s. It was the brazen will and divine intervention that delivered a decisive victory against Saddam Hussein. Forget about the realities of the war. This is the narrative. Um, and, and it is the clerical establishment in its timidity has consistently underestimated the divine will. And so uh, basically, I, I'm going to leave it there, but you're going to see a far more uh, incautious, less maneuvering government uh, in control of a bomb that believes in direct confrontation and then divine intervention. So, leave it there and then uh, we can... Samantha or shall I say Shahrazad since... Uh... <laughs> Uh, well, well, thank you. Um, I, as when, when Scooter and Hillel asked me to do this, um, I, I started thinking about, right, not me as me, but <laughs> me as uh, some Iranian official in the national security apparatus, and thinking, okay, great, now we have a, a nuclear weapon, and, uh, and what a wonderful day this will be. Um, I'd be thinking about uh, the Persian Empire of what it was, because we have to think about you know, why, why do we want a nuclear weapon to begin with, right? Well, you know, as, as far back as, as the Shah, there have been dreams of, of a nuclear weapon. Um, I'd be thinking about the, the Persian Empire at its height. Right? It, and, and just, I mean, maybe you all know, but just to, to reiterate, the Persian Empire at its height included territories, obviously, in Iran, in Iraq, in what's now Pakistan and India, parts of Central Asia, Thrace, Macedonia, much of the Black Sea coast, uh, northern Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Israel, parts of Lebanon, parts of Syria, much of Egypt. This was an empire. And now with, with this small nuclear weapons arsenal, I can envision the empire again. Um, but it's not just the Shah's dreaming that got to this day. It's also, of course, uh, what, what the Islamic uh, Republic of Iran added to this dimension. Um, the, the messianic and, and revolutionary forces. And I want to draw attention to the preamble to the Iran, the Islamic Republic of Iran's constitution, in which it says the army of the Islamic Republic of Iran and the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps will be responsible not only for guarding and preserving the frontiers of the country, and parenthetically, what are those frontiers? Remember the Persian Empire frontiers but also fulfilling the ideological mission of jihad in God's way. That is, extending the sovereignty of God's law throughout the world. So here I am, I'm sitting in Iran, we now have a nuclear arsenal, I'm thinking of, of dreams past, of the extent of the empire that we once ruled, and of course, what God wants us to do, which is to extend God's law the way we see it throughout the world. And now I have a, a device to help me do it. So, I'm sure we're going to talk about you know, how, how those 
how we begin to do that. We begin by empowering disgruntled Shia in other countries around the region. We begin by empowering disgruntled Sunni throughout the region that really look upon their leaders as, as heretics, as, as godless rulers that deserve to be overthrown. We look about being the ones that can carry the flag against the West. But there's a, there's a couple, there's a wrinkle here, which is for the last, you know, decade or more, proud Iran has been under international sanctions. Our economy is not as strong as it should be. Well, so, you know, we deserve to be an economic powerhouse. We have a very educated population. Um, we have a, a, what should be a vibrant steel industry and cement industry, of course, agriculture and foodstuffs, <coughs> a technological base. So the second, path of, of what I intend to do, what we intend to do with our new nuclear arsenal is reclaim our economic powerhouse status. That means slowly, and maybe not so slowly, ridding, ridding our country of these sanctions. And, I mean, Pakistan and India got out from those sanctions. We're going to get out from those sanctions too, and we are going to reclaim our, our path as an economic powerhouse in the region. We're smarter than the other people. We've got the resources that we need, so this is going to be another path to what we want to achieve both in the country, in the region, and in, and in the world. And then there's, uh, there's this other tricky part, which uh, has been a bane in our existence, which of course is uh, the role of the United States in the region. But now we have a, a nuclear arsenal. Okay, it's not, it's not large, maybe it'll get larger, but how would we now use this to really rid ourselves of the big Satan that's hanging around in our backyard, that is causing, you know, the, the, the cause of all this. Well, you know, we can talk later about, uh, you know, whether we'd actually engage in, in asymmetric warfare and, and how we would do this, and, and there's lots of examples that I'm sure we'll go through as the day wears on. But I want to take, I want to just, um, just put one thing on the table, which is um, China. So here I am, I now have a nuclear, nuclear arsenal, and, um, and, and uh, I'm looking around saying, okay, how can I undercut America's role in this region? Um, China's really interesting because even though under sanctions, oil purchases from Iran declined about a third during the first three months of 2012, um, China still needs Iranian oil, still needs oil from the region. Um, it, uh, total car demand in China is expected to climb to 30 million purchases a year <laughs> by 2020. Okay? So they need, they need things to power their economy, power their vehicles, <laughs> um, power their rising middle class, get their poor from, from out of poverty. And they need a stable oil supply. Right? So, you know, a, a quick trip to Beijing and saying, look, I, you know, we'll get to whether Saudi nuclearizes in a moment or in the next panel or whenever, whenever our fearless leaders want us to go there. Um, but uh, China needs stability in this region. And America can no longer provide that stability. Now, Tehran is now a nuclear weapons state. And, uh, you know, we in Tehran, we're not taking any calls from Washington anymore. But Beijing, maybe we'll take the call from Beijing. Maybe we'll keep those straits open for Beijing for a China that's more active in the region. Now, let me just state, this is the last thing that China wants. China does not want a balancing role in the Middle East. Um, but, you know, frankly, they may get something that they don't want uh, because they may be able to be the only one that can play a balancing role that we, the, an empowered nuclear Iran, would allow to play in the region. Um, so again, you know, I put on the table that this allows us to uh, achieve our, our grand territorial ambitions that we've been dreaming about for hundreds of years, um, allows us to attain our, our rightful place as an economic powerhouse in the region, and uh, we finally get to chase uh, uh, the, the great Satan um, from our area, and I'm sure we'll get to the little Satan. But uh, thank you. Um, I don't know if it's fitting. Uh one way or the other, but uh, I call on Ali, uh, the, whose namesake is the, uh, so to speak, the founder of this whole enterprise. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for providing me with this opportunity to share my uh, analysis uh, video. Uh, 
nuclearization of Iran is not only going to change the balance of power in the region, it's also going to change the balance of power be between different elite groups inside of Iran. Uh, that change in the balance of power is already taking place. It's going to accelerate the date and the moment that Iran becomes a nuclear power. Uh, as Ambassador Haqqani would probably tell you later, uh, Pakistan <coughs> becoming nuclear power benefited, first and foremost, the Pakistani military institution. Why? Because the Pakistani military, which was promoting, was advancing, and was the engine of the nuclear program of Pakistan, was considered by the public as uh, the institution in the country which was enhancing the prestige of Pakistan. Now, just take a look at the nuclear program in Iran. It's the Revolutionary Guards, which is uh, using its uh, networks to purchase uh, components for the program. It's the nuclear um, uh, scientists of the Revolutionary Guards who are engaged in development of the program, and it is even the Revolutionary Guards which is tasked with the physical guarding of the nuclear facilities. In other words, the day that Iran becomes a nuclear power, uh, the Revolutionary Guards is also going to be considered as the institution which made Iran a great power and is uh, also going to benefit from that. Uh, the change in the composition of power in Iran and also change of balance of power between different elite groups is, is very, very important. Uh, ever since 1979, Iran is a country which was ruled by the clerics, uh, but protected against internal and external enemies uh, by the Revolutionary Guards. In other words, the Revolutionary Guards has traditionally had a dual function, protecting the regime against internal and external enemies. That has, of course, paved the path of the Revolutionary Guards to intervene in the domestic politics of Iran. Ever since the end of the war with Iraq, the Revolutionary Guards was engaged in post-war reconstruction, which paved the path of the Revolutionary Guards in economy of the Islamic Republic. And ever since the presidency of Mr. Mohammad Khatami, who started the so-called reform process, and because of that reason, was called Ayatollah Gorbachev, in Iran, uh, the Revolutionary Guards has been active in the political scene because the Supreme Leader has actively urged former officers of the Revolutionary Guards to engage in politics as a counterbalance to the reforming forces in my country. And the Revolutionary Guards gaining hold of the bomb would also mean further change, would mean that the Revol Revolutionary Guards will, will in reality transform Iran into a military dictatorship. The mentality of the Revolutionary Guards officers who are also ultimately going to be in charge of the bomb, that is the big question in, 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 in my understanding, is very different than the clerical class which is ruled around. Clerics usually come from uh, either, either from the rural uh, uh, classes, uh, not all of them poor, uh, uh, some of them actually the rural rich, for example the Rafsanjani family, uh, or uh, some of the people from the outskirts of smaller towns. Uh, these good people are extremely well educated. Uh, a gentleman like Mr. Rafsanjani, he used his youth traveling around the world. He traveled to the United States, to Canada, to Japan, Malaysia, Indonesia. In other words, he knew exactly how the world was functioning. And so do many, many other clerics. But the new generation of Revolutionary Guards officers which is ruling Iran today and which is likely to control the nuclear bomb, they spend their youth fighting the Iran-Iraq war. The Iran-Iraq war, ladies and gentlemen, was very much like World War I in European history, a trench warfare in which our soldiers lost 250,000 of their comrades. They saw their comrades coughing up their lungs and they blamed the West for supplying Iraq with chemical devices to build those, uh, those, those chemical bombs against our soldiers. And uh, towards the end of the war, a myth was created within the body of the Revolutionary Guards uh, that uh, uh, we can win the war. Of course, everybody who knew how the war was being conducted knew that in, by 1988 there was absolutely no way that we could win the war. But the 
Revolutionary Guards uh, commanders, particularly Mr. Mohsen Rezaei, who was the commander of, of the entire organization back then, he created a, an Iranian version of the German Dolchstoss myth. Dolchstoss myth, of course, was the myth that the general staff in Germany created and Hitler used politically uh, uh, until his rise in, in power to say that had the civilian politicians in Berlin not betrayed the German army, Germany could have won World War I. That was the myth they created. In the Revolutionary Guards, they have made, a, uh, they have created and fabricated a similar myth. They argue that it was Mr. Rafsanjani who forced Grand Ayatollah Khomeini to drink from the chalice of poison. Had Iran continued the war, we could have won. And therefore, this new generation of politicians, of decision makers, of strategists, they have a vindictive approach to politics. Their main project is correcting the injustice of the past in Iranian history. Therefore, I unfortunately expect that the Revolutionary Guards is going to use the, 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 the nuclear bomb not by, let's say, uh, bombing Iranian adversaries. This is not their way of thinking. I know that there are some people here in this town who believe that the Revolutionary Guards officers are very, very devout, and each of them are promised 72 virgins in the next world if they become martyrs. But, but these people, believe me, many of these Revolutionary Guards commanders, they have 70, 720 virgins in this world. <laughs> if, if, if they go to heaven, it would be a decline in their living standard. <laughs> They, they are not in a hurry to, to, to become martyrs. No, but they believe that the bomb provides them with a protective shield to advance their interests. And unfortunately, this <coughs> always leads to miscalculations. Just take a look at how they behave. Taking hostage, imprisoning British sail sailors in Chateau Arab, or Arvan route, as we say. And Iran, they even do not have the bomb yet. Take a look at how many provocations the Revolutionary Guards makes in the Persian Gulf region against the U.S. Navy, the mighty U.S. Navy. And just imagine how their behavior would be the day that Iran also has the bomb. They are not martyrdom seekers. They are not seeking martyrdom, but they unfortunately are going to challenge U.S. interests and the, in, the interests of the U.S. allies to a degree that it could lead to miscalculations. I'm not so much afraid of ideology. Uh, but I'm very, very afraid of miscalculation. Let me also mention another actor in this region uh, which has not been uh, mentioned, Hezbollah in Lebanon. Just imagine how Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah is going to behave the day that the patron in, in, in Tehran, or partner if you want to use that word, becomes a nuclear power. Uh, would they try to advance their interests more or less aggressively? Uh, unfortunately, I believe that all nuclear states are going to make certain mistakes in their history, just as the U.S., the uh, Soviets, you know, China, even Pakistan did. There is always a learning process involved whenever you get the bomb. Uh, and I genuinely hope uh, that if uh, the Islamic Republic is going to get the bomb, that we uh, will try to learn from experiences of the others. But to be quite honest, with this new generation of rulers, I'm not so sure. Thank you. Um, sure. Um, well, thank you for the excellent beginning here. Um, so now the question is whether the change agenda or whether it's um, the will of Allah or whether we're talking about restoring the Persian Empire or whether we're correcting past injustices, I think, in terms of all of you views, what do they do now? What are, the di what are the different permutations that events might take? What speculate now about well, where is it they're going to apply their efforts? Um, chronology is important for future interaction, uh, but not necessarily for your first. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just add to that the, uh, uh, I mean, beginning with Hussein, there was a list of, of uh, desirable objects of ambition. Is there, uh, would there be a, a clear set of priorities um, actually, Ali mentioned it, and I had m alluded to it without going into detail. I think the first uh, uh, l line would be uh, to encourage uh, the proxies in the Arab region. Uh, 
uh, it's not just that Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah will feel emboldened. I think it will be part of a strategy to embolden him further and to try and see if there can be other proxies uh, in uh, the Emirat, in Qatar, in uh, Bahrain, um, in, uh, in, 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 in Syria, uh, and in Iraq. So I think there will be a, uh, because now Iran has the prestige, and by the way, I think that most, all four of us actually converge on a number of things. You know, there is the prestige element, there is the desire, you know, whether you call it just change the status quo or uh, correct past injustices, whether it's to try and become a global and regional player, uh, which means challenging the United States and uh, and preparing for any possible retaliation from the United States by inflicting greater damage to U.S. interests in the region. All of these things are actually not mutually exclusive. So I personally feel that the first uh, immediate consequence would be to push for change in the region through proxies, which will also be the main means and instrument of trying to <clears throat> get out of sanctions. Because if you think about it, uh, if, you, if, if, if the Gulf countries start saying, hey guys, we are feeling more pressure from Iran because of, uh, uh, because of these sanctions. Now you spoke to India, you spoke to in Pakistan, you started talking to them about changing the global nuclear uh, non-proliferation regime. Start those talks with Iran. Then the Europeans, of course, will also start getting on board with that particular line because the Europeans always, Europeans don't like exercising power anymore. They just like sort of finding ways to bargain their way out or write checks if they can, especially if the checks are drawn on some other bank uh, <laughs> than their own. Um, so, so, so they will start doing all of that. And I am not certain about um, how China would see this <coughs> development, but China wouldn't. Um, I don't know if everybody on the panel agrees, but China would not be averse uh, to a, a possible diminishing of uh, uh, U.S. influence in the Middle East, even if it does not want to be the replacing power in that region because it knows the Chinese are, are very proud of their civilization. And one of the things 5,000 years has taught them is that there are certain regions where you don't try to bring too much change uh, because getting involved there is going to just sort of suck your energy. Uh, so therefore, I think that's that's where they go. They go with, here we are, we're a nuclear weapons power, here's our prestige, here's our pride. You will see marches in Lebanon by, um, by Hezbollah. You will even see huge demonstrations uh, uh, in, 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 in the West Bank and in Gaza by Hamas. Uh, the Bahraini uh, uh, sort of uh, Wifaq will be out in the street celebrating, etc. And then, as a result of that, you will have pressures on these, some of them very, very fragile regimes, uh, which will then say, okay, it's time to talk to Iran. They already have it. You couldn't stop them from getting it. Now talk to them, end the sanctions, let them come out and treat them a little more uh, equally than you have done in the past. That's the first step. Others can sort of have other ideas but they can also build up on that, on where it goes next. But there will be huge pressure on the Gulf. And we've already heard from the Saudis. I mean, Prince Turki al Faisal keeps saying that, you know, uh, uh, Iran's going nuclear will have immediate uh, 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 sort of consequences for what Saudi Arabia does. So whether Saudi Arabia tries to shop in the world to buy a bomb, which is what Saudi Arabia's traditional pattern is, uh, they don't make things, they buy them. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and, and, and then we have to see uh, what some of the other Arab regimes do. Then, one of the things we have and none of us have spoken about is significant changes are already taking place in the Arab Middle East. So, for example, uh, what does a Muslim Brotherhood-led Egypt decide? Does it decide, now do we go into the stage of, okay, so the Iranians have it fine, now the Ummah has two bombs, or do they say, no, it's the right of each one of us? And, 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 and does somebody in Iran sell them nuclear technology like somebody somewhere else sold Iran some technology, etc., etc.? So those are the things that are going to be down the road. But the first step, if I'm the decision maker in Iran, I would say, okay, we have the bomb. Now let's tell those Bahrainis 
to get out of Bahrain. I mean, the Bahraini uh, ruling elite, and let's tell the uh, the Gulf region who's boss. And the proxies really become very, very active. And basically, the nuclear nuclear capability is itself a very important thing. It's a weapon of mass destruction, but it it being used as the umbrella for further asymmetric warfare to diminish the influence of Iran's rivals and also for pushing back on the United States and others in the region. That would be the way to go. So <clears throat> if I may follow up on this point, I'll then ask uh, other people to respond. Um, and this was a point brought up by Shahrazad as well, the sanctions, uh, taking those off. Um, we, there would be a situation in which um, the Iranians wouldn't have to plead their own case. The, our allies in the region would say, um, we've got to remove the sanctions. Um, how, how would the Iranians themselves see then their economic situation? Assuming that the sanctions are removed, what do they want to see with regard to uh, oil and energy in the region? How does that, what do they see as their interest and how would they pursue that? Uh, a lot of oil flowing, a little bit of oil flowing, and so forth. If, if, if I may just say one thing on this one without going into the details, there are more uh, there are people more capable and competent in the field of economic around the table. I think that the Iranians <coughs> do basically, they try to get a better price for oil. Um, the bottling up of the gas, because you must remember that Iran Iran's unsold product right now is natural gas uh, product or uh, uh, resource uh, because gas is best, best sold through pipeline. And, 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 and uh, the sanctions have hurt the pipelines most. So they immediately sort of, you know, the Iran, Pakistan, India pipeline, which enables them to sell their gas to India. Uh, uh, Iran, Turkey, natural gas pipeline, which enables them to sell it to Europe, um, uh, and then possibly uh, sort of uh, gas pipelines that would allow liquefaction and then liquefied natural gas being sold uh, farther afield, depending on how the cost was. That becomes an immediate thing. Then the revenue that comes from that enables the Iranians uh, to go on some kind of a shopping spree. And if I think I know the Iranian leadership, they would use it smartly. They won't use it to build palaces, uh, unlike others in the region. <laughs> uh, they, will, they, will, they will use it to build industrial capability mm. uh, and, and, and further capacity. But at the same time, going to what Ali said, it will also enhance both the prestige but also the ability to keep the population happier. Because if you can have some relaxation, forget about ending, just the relaxation of the sanctions, it gives the regime the capacity to make people happier. And that then actually perpetuates the Iranian revolution and those in this town who since 1979, in this town and in Los Angeles, who have dreamt of overturning the Iranian revolution, they may have to forget about that completely because that would just entrench the revolution if the revolution can actually give people bread, consumer goods, and faith, and the bomb, all at the same time. What more do you want? Uh, one second, David. Um, I, I did want to say uh, we don't have very much time for uh, questions uh, from you all, but uh, we have a little bit. Uh, we've passed out cards on which you can write down a question and um, are, uh, they can be brought up here and we'll, we'll try to a ask a few questions towards the end of the panel. Um, well, sort of bouncing off of what Ambassador Haqqani started with, I, I, I would see three areas in which you would see a prioritization by the regime. The first one would be the owner, and I'll skip over the first two very, very, very quickly and then go to the third. The first one would be the ownership of regional Shiism. Um, you know, going, going back to what I, it, 
to really understand the spirit of this regime, I think you really have to read up on the history of the Safavids. That's the dynasty a half a millennium ago, Azeris from Erdabil, who Shiified Iran. They were originally, as I said, Azeris, uh, Sunnis, Sufis, who linked up with militarized orders and then essentially Shiified Iran as a, as a node in opposition to Istanbul. And that will define the characteristics, I think, to some extent. So you will see a crowd that is not biding time, but it will be perpetually challenging the arsenal and seat of the Sunni order, which is increasingly Turkey, but also has implications for Saudi Arabia. Then the second priority would be ownership of Islam. It is central to the narrative of this regime that Islam was robbed from the Shiites, the proper custodians of Islam, millennium ago. And its decline and its despotism is deeply anchored to this robbery. It's malaise, the malaise of Islam, and it's being uh, removed from leadership above the West is anchored to this, this robbery. So it will propel Iran back into thinking about itself as the leader of, uh, of, of Shiism, and through that, the, sh the restoring of Shiism to its proper role in control of Islam. This, though, tees it up for, the, for the, I think, the highest priority, which is to directly begin to challenge the West. Um, and it is not reconciled to a superior West. Uh, and I think this will play itself out in energy on two levels. Uh, going back to the ownership of Islam, remember in the narrative of robbery of Islam, it is not an escaped, it, it's not a fact that escapes notice to the Iranian regime that the energy resources in the region tend to reside under Shiite feet. They may be <laughs> under the empires of, of Sunni countries like, like Saudi Arabia, but the oil and gas is under areas inhabited by Shiites that were confiscated by the Sunnis. And that therefore this inheritance given to them by Allah is again being robbed, like Islam itself. So there would be, I think, a, a fairly strong move to bring, at least Finlandize, countries in which Shiites exist and have oil resources, maybe Iraq, for example, but but also to challenge countries like Saudi Arabia and the Shiite control of, of, of uh, the control of the Shiite areas. But the energy also, I think, has another thing, which is if you go back and see how the Iranians read the West right now, and say, listen, the United States, like in the last remake of Bo Jest, keeps putting down these red lines of what they will not tolerate on the nuclear weapon program. Iran steps over those lines, and then the West says, well, okay, Okay, fine, but this is a new red line. You're not going to step over that. And this just keeps going on and on. So they've determined that ultimately the West is not deeply, it is not a red line truly for the West, the nuclear program. Then they look at the question of freedom, democracy, all these values that we in the West pursue. But at the end, in 2009, we made it very clear we had higher priorities than the budding revolution after the uh, elections that re-elected Ahmadinejad where the West does seem to be very sensitive is the flow of oil and its energy because it seems to the Iranians that the West's entire economy depends now on not only the flow of oil but the pricing of oil. So my expectation is it is precisely against that issue that they will go because they've read it from us that that is our deepest sensitivity and our deepest vulnerability. And that therefore they will begin to attack the very essence of the West, begin to challenge the West's survival in their mind by, by forcing an economic collapse of the West, which would be done through uh, ensuring a very high price of oil. Um, so I would expect those three priorities to sort of commence uh, the, the Iranian sort of emboldened state. So, <clears throat> so if I may uh, restate that, it seems like the, the the focus on the energy issue was a twofer. Uh, it, it accomplishes uh, more immediate purposes and also the larger global ambition. 
So day one, um, I look around and uh, I see that my country on some dimensions isn't really doing so well. Um, I, inflation is at 22 and a half percent. That's up in 2011. That's up from 12.4 percent in 2010. Um, <clears throat> industrial production growth rate is down by 2.7 percent, excluding oil. 18.7% uh, of our population is below the poverty line. You know, I read the I read the papers. I know that some Tunisian, you know, fruit vendor lit himself on fire not just because he wanted freedom, but because he couldn't, you know, he couldn't get a permit. He couldn't operate his his fruit stand. I mean, there was an economic dimension to all of this too. So I need to get rid of those sanctions. Um, but I think I'd, I'd actually look to my neighbor, Pakistan, and, and take a lesson in terms of, you know, being a responsible stakeholder may not get me the removal of sanctions as quickly as I want them to be. So because the, the, the West and, and the world doesn't always um, uh, move quickly to reward responsible stakeholders, but they seem to uh, move quicker when there's a troublemaker afoot. So the first actions would not be, okay, I have a bomb, I'm going to be a, a, a responsible stakeholder in the world. It's, I have a bomb, and things can get really ugly really quickly, so you better give me what I want. So troubles <laughs> start to occur in, in the region and beyond. Things may go boom, uh, people get scared, and I get, I get what I want. Um, but what do I do with this? And again, I'll, I want to go back to, uh, to the Iranian constitution, um, which says that, the economy is a means, quote, and all that is required of a means is that it should be an efficient factor contributing to the attainment of the ultimate goal. Uh, you know, very Marx, you know, obviously it's straight from the, the, the mouth of Marx, but, um, you know, that's, that's what they want. I mean, they, the economy is not for the sake of, of opportunity and the future of their children, but it's for the attainment of the, of the goal. Um, let me just kind of step out from this for a second. I don't think, frankly, that'll work. I mean, again, looking to the lessons of Pakistan, I don't think they're very good lessons um, that this will actually help their economy, that, uh, you know, and especially in the case of Iran, if they continue down the path of centrally controlled planning, um, they're not going to make the right decisions as to where they're put their money. It's not going to be an efficient use of, of uh, money, at least not in the near term. But I do think that's the kind of TikTok um, in rapid succession once, once they get the weapon, uh, how they proceed uh, uh, in the next rollout of the next weeks, months, and so on. Well, I, I hope that I'm not uh, offending Ambassador Haqqani, but if you want to know, you know how Iran is going to behave when it has the bomb, you just have to take a look at how Pakistan is behaving today. Uh, a country which is hosting Mr. Osama bin Laden. Uh, people in Washington know that. So you take you send a group of people to kill Mr. Osama bin Laden in Pakistan. But the United States still pays money to Pakistan, uh, military aid. Well, you know, from Washington's perspective, that may be a bit strange. But from Iran's perspective, that's the ideal scenario. Uh, that is the lesson that world politics is teaching the new generation of Revolutionary Guards officers in Iran. And I'm honestly not so terribly sure that they're going to use the money that they will receive from, you know, lifting of sanctions on development. No, you know, this is not how things happen in the third world. You know it. In the third world, political decision makers first and foremost, think about their own corporate interests. In other words, if you want to understand the behavior of the Iranian state, you need to open up the black box of the state and take a look at the institutions and their own interests. The, in, in this case, if my thesis on militarization of Iran is right and transformation of Iran into a military dictatorship is right, well, then we need to think about what would be in the interests of the corporate interests of revolutionary guards, not so much in the interests of the state. If there is too much economic development, there is actually bound to be a genuine revolution. Let's not forget, <laughs> social revolutions never happen in totally impoverished countries. No. 
social revolutions, including the social revolution which removed the Shah in 1979, happened at a time when the economy was doing fairly well. The Iranian middle class was growing, Iranians were going to universities, were getting better and better educated, had access to information, and had also relative you know, degrees of freedom in reality, because the Shah was, was, wanted to depict himself as a benevolent dictator. Now, unfortunately, these Revolutionary Guards officers, they know their history lessons, and I'm not so sure that they are going to free us from the poverty uh, that is uh, um, has that, that that has been been our problem for for the past 33 uh, years. So uh, yes, day one after uh, Iran uh, makes the nuclear test, uh, some Iranians may feel very very proud uh, because they believe in we believe in the third world that the bomb is uh, some kind of an a civilizational equalizer that makes us the equals of the United States and the most advanced economies of the world. Uh, but on uh, day two and three and fourth, we will find out that we are going to be just like our neighboring Pakistan. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to give um, one of our uh, other panelists from uh, the second session a chance to uh, introduce a point or ask a question. In the meantime, if you do, if you have written some questions on the cards, uh, someone will come down the aisle and collect them and see how many we can handle afterwards. Ah, uh, yeah, we we have a mic. Um, Voice. Yeah, why don't, why don't you do that? Okay, two brief questions. Ah, um, uh, we'll hold it. Really. We do have them. Thank you. Hi. Uh, two quick questions uh, for anyone who'd like to answer them. The first is, what happens to the uh, internal opposition movement inside of Iran after it gets the bomb? We hear that Iranians uh, generally are nationalistic, and they all want a nuclear bomb. They think it's part of their historical legacy. We also hear about what happens if uh, Iran is attacked by the U.S. or Israel that the question is whether or not Iranians will rally around the flag or whether they'll recognize a weak regime and uh, contenders will go for the main chance. So my question is, again, to anyone, just the first one, what happens to the internal opposition movement? The second question has to deal uh, with different Iranian assets. I guess I'm going to direct this specifically at David, who looks at this a lot, I know. How does what Hassan Nasrallah calls the balance of terror change on the uh, Israel-Lebanon border. I, I mean, I, I guess I'm curious, maybe, maybe it doesn't change, and maybe things, maybe Hezbollah, uh, just to, in, the, uh, in the spirit of provocation, uh, maybe Hezbollah is actually weakened, maybe different actors inside of Lebanon take advantage, recognizing there's an internal balance of power there, and if Iran gets the bomb, people would want to be quick to act inside against Hezbollah, against whom nuclear weapons, as well as plenty of missiles and rockets, but nuclear weapons aren't going to do anything against Salafis or Lebanese forces. My quick answer to the opposition question, if Agha Ali is correct that Iran behaves exactly like Pakistan does, then the opposition just goes, sort of, you know, is just decimated. Uh, basically, hyper-nationalism takes over, and hyper-nationalism is uh, always yeah. pro-militarist. Uh, because the military is the is the is the means of ensuring the success of that uh, um, of that hypernationalism, and uh, and and that's where it goes. Correct uh, yeah. me if I'm yeah. wrong. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, on the internal opposition, you might be familiar with the concept, Lee, of uh, the strong horse. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Lee wrote a book on it. Uh, but at any rate, the, the, the point is that I think the Iranian regime has used the nuclear negotiations until now, and it would use the achieving of a bomb as a, as, as a sign to the internal opposition that the West is scared of the regime, and that they are so strong that the West itself cannot challenge the regime, and that that deflates any confidence or any hope that the internal opposition would have of challenging the system. I think there's a permanent, deep divorce between the Iranian people and the regime, but there's also a deep sense of quiescence and uh, it, hopelessness among Iranians that is reinforced by the inability of the West to challenge Iran on its nuclear program. So I would expect the regime to become very uh, aggressive 
in rooting out and destroying its opposition. As far as its assets go, I think there's been a debate uh, sort of reflected to what I, in 2006 there was even a debate within Hezbollah whether to launch the war to do the provocative acts that triggered the war in 2006 against Israel and again it was that same divide you know better watch out those Israelis can be very dangerous they can really do a big number on on Hezbollah uh, and they they, uh, they argued for caution and um, there was another crowd that said listen you guys in a Lebanese context are sunk you, you, you're not going to redeem yourself in the post-2005 environment through actions that you can do to directly redeem yourself. Iran, in its rise in the region, is the mechanism through which you in Lebanon will be redeemed. So jump, you know, throw, throw yourselves on the sword and help deliver Iran a victory. And that translated into a very aggressive policy that, again, was reflective of the divisions within Tehran that we've outlined already. So what I would expect with the bomb is to see Hezbollah become, again, far more aggressive. Uh, and uh, uh, it would validate that crowd that says, take chances. I don't have anything really to add to that. May I just say that Hezbollah has already become emboldened. Uh, as a matter of fact, nowadays it's the Revolutionary Guards which is trying to calm down Hezbollah. Uh, we had a rare glimpse into this as the Iranian press, uh, by mistake, published an interview uh, made by uh, Major General uh, Qasem Soleimani, chief of the Quds Force of the Revolutionary Guards, who uh, talked about a, a phone conversation he had with Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah in which uh, Mr. Soleimani urged uh, Mr. Nasrallah uh, to remove anyone from positions of responsibility who believes in preemptive action against Israel. Uh, because, you know, uh, presumably the Islamic Republic expects and, and fears that Israel would use uh, any pretext uh, to launch uh, missile attacks against Iran's nuclear facilities. And the provocative rhetoric that Mr. Uh, Nasrallah is making in his weekly speeches could fuel that uh, pretext. So um, let's see if we could talk for a second about <coughs> Iran has ratcheted up pressure under your scenarios in Shia areas around Iran and other areas around Iran. What could happen? Uh, what might happen next? I mean, what, which of those areas might succumb to it or with their own internal pressures are, are subjected to it? You think of Bahrain, you think of Iraq, you think of Shia portion of Iraq, you think of the eastern part of the second area. Um, we could speculate on how events might move from. Well, I, let me just, just throw one thing on the table. I mean, clearly, you know, the, Bahrain would, would heat up even more so. You know, whether or not right now, whether it's, uh, you know, that the Shia and Bahrain have legitimate, obviously, legitimate grievances. Um, there is a disgruntled population there, and what's happened, you know, since they began protesting is is ripe for, for uh, uh, you know, Iran to sow a lot of mischief in that area. Um, but if it comes as well at the same time that things are heating up on the eastern, you know, provinces of Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia is now got to look internally. I mean, you know, what they've done over the last couple of months, they didn't really have to think about big big problems on their home territory. Now they actually also have to think about that. Um, so, you know, opening up a lot of these fronts is, <coughs> would seem to be the way to get uh, people to start crying uncle, and, and these aren't the bravest of, of forces in the region anyway, um, uh, would seem to be the first thing that goes. So multiple, many, many areas, many, many problems, many, many, you know, conflagrations beginning. Um, <clears throat> I have a couple of uh, questions. Let me say the, the questions from that I've collected from the audience are all very good, but they're actually, in a way, pertain most to our second panel, which is how will everyone else react? Uh, <clears throat> are people going to take this lying down, or are they going? Is there a comeback either within the region or from? Uh, the wider world, meaning by that the United States, Europe, China, and so forth. So, uh, I will. That's just an advice to our uh, second group of panelists that uh, people are most interested in how that uh, are very interested in how that is going to, to work out. 
Um, there were a couple of questions um, that I might use as representative. Um, one question really wants to ask, um, uh, the general spirit of, of the remarks of our panelists has been um, Iran is ambitious and will feel even more, be feeling more of its oats once it gets a nuclear arsenal. Uh, just really wants to put it into question, might they not really want to hunker down and preserve what they have? Why is that so implausible? Um, and um, this question carries over in a way, uh, another question uh, is, uh, and precisely I think for uh, Ambassador Haqqani is, how, uh, how does this really affect the Sunni-Shiite dynamic in the region overall? And, um, and uh, on top of that, I would like to ask this question. But <clears throat> you mentioned, and this is for the next panel, the prospect that Egypt, Saudi Arabia will look for a bomb. But um, in the short term, how will they react before they have a bomb, if they, if they can get a bomb? Is, will Egypt feel um, uh, that there's some advantage to being friendlier to Iran? Uh, um, how will Turkey feel about this? Uh, how does this Sunni Shiite thing play out in the shorter term until such time as people feel are feeling more their oats. And uh, finally, um, but this does, I think, carry over to the next uh, panel. The question is, if, if Iran really does take some very dramatic action in the, in the Gulf and Straits of Hormuz um, in particular, doesn't this really finally get um, the affected parties, principally Europe, United States, um, to uh, get off their duff and do something. Uh, would, wouldn't that uh, really provoke uh, some really substantial reaction? Admittedly, at that point, it would be um, uh, standing in a hole that it had dug itself, but um, it would presumably not be without any resources to respond. But I think that does really belong to to our, uh, our second panel. So uh, why don't you see what makes sense to say about that and then we'll take a coffee break and then come back. Well, concerning the issue of Iran being a revisionist <coughs> power or status quo power, uh, unfortunately there is, a, a, I would say, a thinking, a, a national security doctrine within the revolutionary gods. And that was in that national security doctrine was reached during uh, Mr. Mohammad Montazeri, one of the uh, founders of the revolutionary gods. And by the way, the first head of the in the, the liberation movements unit of the revolutionary guards after that we see people like mr mehdi hashimi and even today um, um, major general uh, qasem soleimani they fundamentally believe that in order to avoid having foreign powers attacking iran uh, iran needs to keep them busy somewhere else in other words, by creating proxies and helping them and creating regional <laughs> conflicts, let's say in Lebanon, Israel would not be able of attacking mainland Iran. That is, you know, the fundamental thinking. Of course, there is a fallacy in this philosophy because when Iran actively supports terrorist organizations, uh, then the outside world would actually be interested in trying to counterbalance Iran and trying to uh, reduce Iranian influence uh, in the region. But unfortunately, uh, the Revolutionary Guards officers do not seem to have changed their national security doctrine, and that remains one of the fundamentals of, of their uh, thinking. Now, the second part of this issue is if uh, uh, non-Iranian Shia are willing to be a part, to play a part in this scheme of the Revolutionary Guard. Um, and the answer to this is a bit complex. Uh, I have to say this. Uh, the non-Iranian Shia are not agents of the regime in the Islamic Republic of Iran. No, not at all. They are good and decent citizens living in their own countries. But most unfortunately, in many of those countries, even the basic rights of the Shia people are not respected. In Saudi Arabia, what does it mean when the state sends bulldozers to bulldoze and demolish mosques, Shia mosques in the eastern province? when there are so many political prisoners among the Shia, when the Shia do not have access 
uh, equal access to wealth of Saudi Arabia, the same way that the Sunni majority has. That, of course, creates a lot of grievances that opens the path to infiltration and abuse political instrumental use of the, of, of the Revolutionary Guards and the Islamic Republic of the Shia population. <coughs> the same thing also goes for Bahrain. Uh, I was in Bahrain and I have to tell you this. The Bahraini Shia are good and decent Bahraini citizens. They are not agents of the Islamic Republic. But when they feel abandoned by their own government, when they feel that the parliament has no real political power, that their representatives cannot affect day-to-day -day politics of the Bahraini Shia community. When they see that the police force is increasingly dominated by people who are naturalized Bahraini citizens, people who are imported from Sunni countries, particularly Iraq, to even, even some, in, in some cases from Pakistan or Jordan, Pakistani police officers who do not even speak Arabic are asked to suppress the Bahraini Shia, of course that creates grievances because you end up feeling like a foreigner in your own country. Now, take a look at Bahrain. The, the conflict is unfortunately very, very fast spreading to neighboring countries, both to Saudi Arabia, but unfortunately, and that may be new to you, but also to some degree to Kuwait. The Kuwaiti government is much more sophisticated in its dealings with the Shia population, far more sophisticated. They have been dealing much better with the Shia population, and they have not had the type of problems that we are witnessing in Bahrain or Saudi Arabia. But because of the problems inside of Bahrain, even they in Kuwait, in sophisticated Kuwait, they are you know, experiencing problems. In other words, Iran has the bomb or has not the bomb. If the, the Sunni rulers in the Persian Gulf region actually treat their own Shia populations in a good and decent way, there is absolutely no way that the Revolutionary Guards or, or the Islamic Republic or any other foreign power can use them instrumentally to advance their own interests. And one of the things that I always tell the uh, Shia political activists in, in the Persian Gulf region is that the Islamic Republic does not really care about you. They care about their own interests. It is not that they care about the Shia. Just take a look at how they are treating Shia Grand Ayatollahs inside of Iran. Grand <laughs> Ayatollah Muntaziri under house arrest until he died. Grand Ayatollah Shirazi, who has many, many followers in the Persian Gulf region, he died under house arrest. The, the institution of the Maraje, you know, Shia sources of emulation, is being increasingly controlled by the state. If we Iranians are lucky, there is going to be a, a stability in Iraq where independent centers of knowledge in Najaf are going to become hermitages for our Grand Ayatollahs who become political refugees in Najaf and who can speak freely because Iran is not a free country for Shia political development. Mm -hmm. So, so, so the, the, uh, even, even forgetting the nuclear issue, uh, the, the matter of Iran abusing Shia populations can be solved very, very simply by treating the Shia citizens in, outside of Iran in a decent way. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to ask uh, uh, David and Samantha to make some final comments. Um, Hussein has another shot uh, in, in the second panel, so... Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> so... Uh, quickly, what I want to actually reiterate, uh, you know, some of what I just said. I, I uh, was in uh, UAE and Kuwait last week, um, and uh, I was was talking to some government officials there, and we were talking about uh, Syria, obviously Iran. I wound Lebanon into the the conversation and said, you know, look, there really could be an opportunity now to fracture Hezbollah, that, you know, the money and the weapons are not coming as quickly as they are from Syria, that the Hezbollah has not been ruling as well as they promised, there's, you know, there, there could be a way to, you know, set up and, and help uh, institutionalize independent Shia voices, you know, and, and that would have them look not to Iran, um, but, you know, they are Lebanese citizens and, and giving them a voice away from Iran. Isn't that what you want? Don't you want to fracture Hezbollah? Unfortunately, the answer was, uh, you know, a flick of the hand 
you know, I, I don't care. It doesn't matter what happens in Lebanon if Lebanon falls apart. So, you know, so be it. Uh, they're all, you know, they all look to Iran anyway. And it was a very unfortunate conversation, and we need to do a lot more work uh, trying to convince our interlocutors over there that there really is a better way for us and for them um, to, to see what Ali was saying. Um, but I just wanted to raise one final thing, and, and we'll probably get to this. We'll get to this in the second panel. I think um, uh, when Iran crosses over that hurdle and becomes a, a, nu a real nuclear weapon state, I think we're going to hear um, uh, a retro phrase again called spheres of influence. And um, uh, this, is, this is going to be where all the jockeying will take place, who's in whose sphere of influence, um, both in the, re the, the narrow region and the broader region. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I took a little quick look even. Um, I, let, me, let me just say, people, people, I think, have the wrong impression that Iran is much more isolated than it is. Okay. I mean, it is still reaching out and being welcomed around the world. Delegations are reaching out. Delegations are going around the world. In the last 10 days, the Iranian Chamber of Commerce um, visited Vietnam, uh, welcomed with open arms, Tbilisi, Georgia, and Tanzania. Okay, so th these are you know, three places very far away from each other, large Iranian Chamber of Commerce delegations being opened with, you know, welcomed with open arms. Um, so people are going to be jockeying around as to who can be in their sphere of influence and uh, who, can, who can actually um, aid them uh, uh, now that they are a nuclear weapon state. So I will leave it with that. David? Um, yeah, in terms of going out on a limb, I, I, I think that thinking through strategically in the next 5, 10, 15 years, um, I think there's a reasonable argument that can be made that the Islamic awakening, which the Iranians call the Arab Spring or the Arab Spring as we call it, could go in a very bad direction and that we may see ourselves having a problem with several centers of Sunni power. And in that context, the, perpetu the continuation of the conflict with Iran puts us in an extremely difficult position, and yet we can't get beyond it until you get beyond the Iranian regime. The achieving of a nuclear weapon, I think, secures the Iranian regime a second life in the long term. And that makes our strategic position, as we're heading into a situation of difficulty in managing our relations with the Sunni world, I think it puts us in an impossible situation. And it, and it prevents us from having a, a Shiite strategy where we actually somehow bring the Shiite world along into a different place, something that Ali's talking about. And second of all, we'll leave it to the second panel to deal with the nuclearization of, say, Saudi Arabia, but, but think about the legitimacy of the Saudi regime if the control of Islam is unchallenged here. They will have to retreat into what they know best to establish their legitimacy. And they will owe nothing to the West in their mind. And you will see them not behaving on issues like Al-Qaeda and the larger world of Wahhabi or Salafi movements that they will need to begin to rely on much more strongly to reassert their legitimacy in this uh, Sunni, you know, excited Sunni state. So I would see that to be a really awful scenario for the West, where we're still in conflict with the Shiite world, and we're entering a period of radical challenge from the Sunni world. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to take a, a short break, uh, and uh, uh, for before our second panel, uh, please join me in thanking our first panel. <clears throat> We did a splendid job, and I, I would say that, um, apropos of Samantha's last comment, that uh, the people she's talking to in the Gulf need some longer-term thinking, uh, perhaps, uh, but they need to be... Slap inside the head. Uh, yes, right. And, but exposed to panels like this, which really tr do try to imagine uh, what, uh, what happens the day after tomorrow, which is, unfortunately, th that's their habit to think only of what happens the day after tomorrow, but um, uh, perhaps they can be a bit jolted by uh, this kind of reflection. Thanks again.
Yeah, it's really depressing. Huh? It's really depressing.